rejoicing, we welcome today to our pulpit the Reverend Mariama White Hammond. Reverend Mariama White Hammond is a powerful spiritual leader in our city and beyond. And she always reminds us of how interwoven we all are to, with one another, with our earth, and with our God. So, whoever you are and whoever, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at King's Chapel. Believer or doubter, seeker or skeptic, we're all on this journey together. Even as crisis and uncertainty keep us physically separated, we continue our journey of faith together. We remember the disciples, lonely and afraid in the upper room. And we remember that in our own crisis, and in theirs, and in their uncertainty, Jesus came through the locked door, stood in their midst, and said to them, Peace be with you. In this moment, in whatever way we're able, let us be that peace for one another. And may the peace of Christ be with us all. Hear these opening sentences from our scripture. From Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go so that they may worship me. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we chiefly to do so when we assemble and meet together, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as for the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present and far away, to accompany me with a pure and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying with me the general confession. <clears throat> Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Hear the words of God's promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us take heart. God will have mercy upon us, being penitent. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness 
and bring us to everlasting life. Now, as Christ has taught us, let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Now, unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be honor and glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The psalm appointed for this day is Psalm 23. Let us read the psalm responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. seated. Take for his name's sake. 
stray of death's dark shade, I will no quit here. first lesson appointed for this day is from the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Bible, chapter 9, verses 13 through 35, concerning the seventh plague. The Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go so that they may worship me. For this time I will send all my plagues upon you yourself and upon your officials and upon your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence and you would have been cut off from the earth. But this is why I have let you live, to show you my power and to make my name resound through all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. Tomorrow at this time, I will cause the heaviest hail to fall that has ever fallen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Send therefore, and have your livestock and everything that you have in the open field brought to a secure place. Every human or animal that is in the open field and is not brought under shelter will die when the hail comes down hard upon them. Those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried their slaves and livestock off to a secure place. Those who did not regard the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the open field. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that hail may fall on the whole land of Egypt, on humans and animals and all the plants of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire came down on the earth. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. There was hail with fire flashing continually in the midst of it, such heavy hail as had never fallen in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the open field throughout all the land of Egypt, both human and animal. The hail also struck down all the plants of the field and shattered every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were, there was no hail. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Pray to the Lord, enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You need stay no longer. Moses said to Pharaoh, as soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There'll be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your officials, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord. 
Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they were late in coming up. So Moses left Pharaoh, went out of the city and stretched out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain no longer poured down on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned once more and hardened his heart, he and his officials. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Here ends the lesson. Be seated. The second lesson appointed for this day is from the Gospel, the Good News according to John in the New Testament, chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. Jesus spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then the blind man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Some of the Pharisees said, This man Jesus is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. Here ends the lesson. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord, all the earth I worship thee, the Father
Please be seated. It is good to be with you here this morning, even if it is only virtual. I thank you to the King's Chapel family for allowing me to share with you this morning. And I hope that in this time of great challenge, that we might hear a word from the Lord. And so I ask with you th that you meditate with me on this topic, power in the plague. In this moment of pandemic, how can we learn from the struggles of our ancestors? Today, we look to a scripture in the book of Exodus. Exodus' story is one of the most familiar in the biblical narrative, but let's just do a quick recap for any of us who may have forgotten the key details. It reminds us that the people of Israel come to Egypt first in good circumstances under the leadership of Joseph, an Israelite who rose to be the right hand of the king. After Joseph and that pharaoh die, a new pharaoh comes to power, and he decides to use the Israelites for their labor. He enslaves them and gets them to building two new cities for him. Things go from bad to worse, and things get harder and harder for the Israelites. Then there's the figure of Moses, an Israelite who was adopted by the Pharaoh's family. He sees how bad things are, have gotten. He gets upset, goes a little far, kills an overseer, and then he must flee Egypt um, out into the wilderness. God finds him in the wilderness, talks to him through a burning bush, and says, go back and tell Pharaoh to free your people. Moses protests quite a bit because I can't do this, and God says, okay, I'm going to give you your brother Aaron. He's the better talker. The two of you get together and go confront Pharaoh. Now, they try to ask nicely, to let, for Pharaoh to let the people go and to worship God in the wilderness. The request is relatively small. Come on, Pharaoh, please let us worship our God. But Pharaoh says no. So thus start the plagues, these miraculous events that God sends that are supposed to change Pharaoh's heart. The first plague is that Pharaoh turns, that Moses turns the Nile River to blood, but then Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. Pharaoh, not impressed. The second plague is a massive infestation of frogs. The magicians can make more frogs, but they can't stop the original frogs. So they start to get a little convinced, but Pharaoh, still not willing to budge. The third plague, vermin, rats, let's say. They start running around everywhere. The music, ma magicians can't duplicate it. So they have to admit that, they are, that they've been bested. But Pharaoh's like, rats, not a big deal. Have you ever seen the rest restaurant alleyways in New Egypt City? I'm not afraid of rats. And so these first three plagues haven't really gotten Pharaoh to change his mind. And then come the next three, a massive insect swarm. That causes Pharaoh to pause. He asks Roses to tell God to stop. But then he says, mm, I'll let you worship close by. Not all the way out in the wilderness, but like close by. And, of course, he kind of breaks his word. And then the fifth plague, live, a livestock epidemic where many cattle die. Pharaoh, maybe he just went vegan, doesn't care. The sixth plague, massive rash on the people. And it doesn't seem to phase Pharaoh at all. I think, you know, maybe he had eczema as a kid and he'd already gotten used to it. So six plagues happen. The people in, in, in Egypt are concerned, but Pharaoh is unfazed. And here we come to this seventh plague. Things start out like they have every other time. Moses and, Pharaoh are telling Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron are telling Pharaoh that he must acknowledge God and let the Israelites worship, or else there will be a plague of thunder and hail. Not just regular thunder and hail, thunder and hail so bad that anyone who is outside will be killed. And Pharaoh basically says, bring it. But the scripture also tells us that there were some leaders in Pharaoh's administration that had been convinced by the previous six plagues 
and they decide that they're going to bring all of their family, all of their slaves, and all of their livestock into the house to shelter in place. And so in this seventh plague, though Pharaoh is unfazed at the beginning, it represents a turning point where he begins to shift. It says in the scripture that he finally says, I acknowledge your God. I will let the people go. Now, a couple of quick reminders, which is that more or less it did not have to go this far. If he had heeded the early warnings, it would not have happened. His unwillingness to take God's word seriously, to take the situation seriously, made things so much worse. At the beginning, his problem was denial. He said, you know, who is this God? My magicians can do the same thing. But even after it becomes clear how serious the situation is, Pharaoh is unwilling to change. It's important for us to think in this moment, as we are bracing, as we are concerned, as we are asking ourselves, which curve will we be? Will we be like those in Korea who took this pretty seriously and have been able to save many people or those in Italy who didn't and are watching many perish? And so we have this Pharaoh who doesn't take this too seriously, but the request each time is the same. Let the people go to worship God in the wilderness. And in this request, there are three things that I think we want to be considering in this moment. God is asking Pharaoh to make this decision because Pharaoh is in charge of an unjust imperial system that has three core problems all addressed in this request. The first is that Pharaoh and Egypt does not acknowledge God. Pharaoh sees himself as the most important thing going. Second, he is over a land where the people are not honored. They are not free, they are not safe, they are unable to live out that which God has called them to be. And finally, he rules over a place where the land is not honored. God specifically asked that the people be released, not to the temples, not even to just worship in their whole own homes. He says, let them go to the wilderness. That is where I will be. And so we must ask ourselves in the midst of this plague and pandemic, where are the idols in our lives? the things that we hold higher than God. Sometimes it's ourselves. <laughs> what are the systems of injustice and oppression that we have allowed to go on far too long? And finally, how have we violated the wilderness? Failed to see it as a sacred place where God is. Many of us have far more thinking time on our hands these days than we've ever had. Maybe we are caught up in concern and depression and anxiety. Maybe we have those thoughts going through our heads again and again, so focused on this moment that we struggle to pull back. But my challenge to us this morning is to be asking ourselves in this moment of great disruption, what are the things being disrupted that absolutely needed to be? What are the things we want to let go of and never go back to? What do I worship that has been stripped away? Maybe it's the football season. Maybe it's the stock market. Maybe it's your addiction to constant busyness. Those things that we worship that lead us to believe we just don't have enough time to pray. We don't have enough time to 
worship. We don't have enough time for the things that God has called us to because we're so caught up in these other things that we worship. In this time of social distancing, how do we think more deeply about justice for our neighbor? That may be on a very small level. Maybe you look up and realize you don't even know your neighbors. But maybe there are also people in your life in need. And now is the time to step up, to push back on systems that allow some of us to have plenty while others are barely surviving. And it's not just about the food that we cook or the calls that we make. These are very important. But what are the systems of oppression that we have allowed to stand as I hear about moratoriums on evictions and people being allowed to keep their water on, I ask myself the question, why can't we do that all of the time? And finally, in what ways have we violated the wilderness, the earth that is God? The reality is that we are in a challenging time, but just like the plagues, there will come a moment where this passes. And the question for each and every one of us is, will we be like Pharaoh? When the moment of urgency has passed, will we go back to being just as we were before? Our challenge during this time is not just to get through, but just to embrace the possibility of disruptive transformation in each of our lives and in our communities. As I opened, we, I asked you to meditate on the idea of power in the plague. The recognition that as we look at Pharaoh, we can offer a critique of how power functioned within the plagues. But also, the power that can enter our lives when we use this time to ask life-transforming, community reimagining, world-changing questions. This is my challenge to you this morning. How do you find power in this plague to be the person, the community that God has always called us to be. I have to admit, I wish it didn't take this much <laughs> for us to consider these things. But when I head back home and get back into my pajamas and continue to cook, I hope that I will also be continuing to become she who God has called me to be more deeply, more powerfully, so that I can be one of those who is faithful in fighting oppression and ending systems that prevent us from worshiping God in the wilderness. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Let us say together the Collect for Grace. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always that which is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the life of the faithful, the joy of the righteous, Mercifully receive the prayers of thy suppliants, that souls which thirst for thy promises may evermore be filled from thine abundance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in whose hand are all the nations of the earth, and from whom all thoughts of love and peace proceed, Kindle in the hearts of all thy people the love of peace. Guide those who govern the nations that we may receive thy kingdom and that this earth may be filled with the knowledge of thy love. And this we ask through him who is called the Prince of Peace, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon the earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favor to behold the President, the Congress, and the courts of the United States, our governor and our mayor, and so replenish them with the grace of thy Holy Spirit that they may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue them plenteously with heavenly gifts, that in all their deliberations they may be enabled to promote the national prosperity and to secure the peace, liberty, and safety of the United States throughout all generations. This we humbly ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom cometh every good and perfect gift, Send down upon all ministers of the gospel and upon the congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for thine infinite mercy's sake, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all humankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of thy people, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for the good estate of thy holy church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians and all those who seek thee by any other name may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate and especially thy servants, 
Wadad Ayad, Christopher Burnett, Jessica Schmidt, Elizabeth Thompson, Ray Hardin, Howard Chadwick Jr., C.L. Hills, Rachel Corey, George Corey, Nicholas H.F., Aja Grace, Judy Power, Melissa, Rachel, Deborah, Mona, Robert Gupton, Clark Allen, D. Clark, Lawrence Young, Jane Venata, Cornelia, Daniel Worth, Carl Henning, Jim, Kristen Phillips, all of those who are concerned about the coronavirus, all of those who have been infected with it, all of those who seek to care for any with it, all of us, the world over, O oh God, who worry for our health and our nation, our world and our earth, and those whom we hold up to thee in silent prayer. May it please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we humbly ask as disciples of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, thou end and thou beginning of all journeys, we offer humble thanks and hearty praises for all thy saints who have found their journeys end in thee. And on this day, we remember especially thy servant, newly gathered to thy glory, Dr. David Cantor. This prayer we make through him who promised us eternal life, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we may show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we ascribe unto thee all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and hast promised by thy beloved Son that where two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them. Granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Even as many of us are far from this physical sanctuary, we journey together with the shepherd, the one who set the captives free 
and made the blind to see. In the midst of death and darkness, the psalmist tells us, fear not. And in that spirit, we make our offerings that together with our community action partners, Common Cathedral, the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute, and the Unitarian Universalist Urban Ministry, we might be goodness and mercy, an overflowing cup for those most in need. Please visit the giving page of our website to make your donations until we can gather once more in person. Dear friends, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us today in this time of pandemic. And who better to preach for us than the Reverend Mariama White Hammond. As you can tell, she is an advocate for ecological and social justice, for youth engagement and spirit-filled organizing. She is the founding pastor of the New Roots AME Church in Dorchester, which is a multiracial, multi-class community that is innovating new ways of being a church. We have been following her church's lead in the book read in Boston, reading the parable of the sower by Olivia Butler. And we are grateful for the opportunity we had to meet with others in her church and in the community to discuss that book. Throughout her work, as you can tell from her sermon, she has been challenging all of us to see the connections between issues of justice, that they are not separate in small little silos. She connects immigration and climate change. She connects energy policy and economic justice. And among other things, she does that as a Green Justice, as a fellow of the Green Justice Coalition, 
where eight different social and environmental justice groups from across our state come together. Her honors our legion, um, and it was wonderful to have her be with us today to say what is the opportunity we can come from this time when we're required to physically be apart from one another but spiritually be alive together. And so with that in mind, dear friends, I urge you to continue to be this community of hope and love that we seek to be for one another, not just within King's Chapel, but in our wider world, to take that time, as she suggests, to do reflection and thinking about how we are called now by God and how this time of change need not be one that is only fleeting, but that is deep and transformative for you. Our priorities here have been to focus on continuing to have a worshiping community for you, to try to continue to be pastorally present to you, and also to find ways in which all of us can gather with one another. And as Reverend White Hammond reminds us, this continues to be a time when we can work closely to support one another in our wider community. You'll find on our websites links to all the ways in which you can engage here at the church and here with worship, but also there are two of our community partners which are in special need, and we have easy ways on the website to learn about that. A need to provide more food with our um, partners at Common Cathedral. Some of you did that this week, but there's a sign-up apparatus on the website, please. They are continuing to be in need of food for those that who are um, sheltering with them, and also an opportunity with the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. The Mother's Day March is coming up, but even though we may not be able to march, we'll have to see, they, their, their ongoing work does not stop, and their ongoing ability to work requires funds. You'll learn more about the, them um, from the website. Please, this is a time for us to deepen our relationships with one another. Finally, you'll see that we have um, opportunities not only to worship in the Sunday morning services, but this week we um, videotaped our contemplative service on Wednesday evenings. Please check that out. And most important, please reach out to one another because all of us are in need. And if you can support someone else with a phone call or a Zoom conversation or with uh, a Facebook post, please do so. This is our great opportunity during this time. With all of that, we um, are glad you are with us today. Let us continue to be strong together, uh, knowing that God holds us and challenges us to make this a time of transformation. Let us conclude with our final hymn, Lord of All Hopefulness. <laughs> Dear friends, life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind. And may the blessings of God Almighty be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.